Well, thank you once again. Thank you, Brother Owen, for that great lesson. Wow. Was that, was that some good preaching or what? Amen? Appreciate that very, very much. Uh, let me say once again, thanks for the invitation to be part of your effort um, in, the, uh, in, in the lectures. I appreciate it very much. Very glad to have this opportunity and hope I'll be able to say something that will be of, uh, <clears throat> of interest and also of encouragement uh, to you. I wish all of you uh, well in your work and uh, know that you'll benefit you know, from uh, these uh, good lessons like you've just heard from Brother Owen. Well, I was given the assignment to <clears throat> uh, speak with, uh, I don't think they used the word boldness on my assignment, wherever I saw the title, Speaking in the Face of Persecution. And uh, we've already alluded to that you know, somewhat in uh, at least uh, my lesson and also the lesson that Brother Owens just gave us. But we are living in some uh, trying times. Uh, we're living in a world of, uh, of uh, that's basically a, Secularistic in thinking, uh, a world of uh, carnality, and a world which is becoming, uh, I think, increasingly hostile to Christianity. Brother Decker said that this lesson was supposed to be uh, a kind of charge. And as I thought about <clears throat> a charge, uh, the best thing that I thought that I could say is actually in the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, where he plainly lays out a charge. Uh, to Timothy, and I thought, well, what better words could be used uh, in the world in which we're living today? And so Paul says to Timothy, the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. <clears throat> My assignment includes uh, saying some things by way of the absolute necessity of continuing to speak the truth, and this verse really lays out for us in a very good way, uh, the nature of what I'm uh, being asked to talk about at this time. Uh, this uh, statement really is the commission under which the Lord's Church functions and uh, under which the, I think the school here also uh, functions. Now, when we think of commission, I think we normally think of Mark 16 and 16, Matthew 28, Luke 24, and things like this, but this is equally a valid commission you know, for the Lord's church. There are four principles that are given in this verse of Scripture that are applicable to your theme. Uh, the first point has to do with the charge itself. Uh, the second point has to do with the content of the charge, that is, the truth that we are to be proclaiming. The third has to do with the <clears throat> challenge to every one of us. And then the final point has to do with the character of those who are to carry out this charge. Let's first of all think about the charge. The things that you have heard of me, the same commit to faithful men. I want us to think a little bit just of, of that little word commit. The things you've heard of me, the same commit to faithful me, uh, men. Now, this, this underscores the absolute necessity of continuing to speak in the face of persecution if the Lord's church is going to continue itself, and if it is going to survive. This is the absolute necessity uh, that um, faces us in this verse of Scripture. At the very beginning of it, notice that there are four generations that are being talked about here. The things that you have heard of me, number one. The same commit thou, number two. To faithful men, number three. Who will be able to teach others also, number four. And I think by implication to another generation and to another generation and to another generation and so forth, and here I am today, and here you are today. Why? Because there are some people who have been continuing this process. They've handed down the Word. They handed it down to another, and in turn that was handed down to another, and so forth, and so here uh, we are. This is God's plan. Now, as I make plans, especially uh, having been involved in so many lectureships over time, uh, generally speaking, I have a backup plan. For example, we might invite a, a brother uh, to speak or, or you know, whatever we've invited him to do. 
And sometimes that brother has faced medical uh, issues. You know, sometimes that brother is facing some kind of trial, you know, in life or whatever. And I'll say, okay, now the lectureship is going to be <clears throat> 10 months from now. We need to have a backup plan just in case, you know, something happens here. And on more than one occasion, I've had to use my backup plan. Now, here's my question. What is the backup plan here? Paul says, the things that you've heard of me, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What's the backup plan? There is no backup plan. This is the plan. God doesn't have a backup plan. This is the plan. His plan, you know, for us to uh, continue to um, be sure that the church is growing and surviving, his plan is to continue to share the message from one person to another. That is the plan. Now, the church must absolutely do this if it is going to grow. Uh, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, about verse 5, to the church at Ephesus, the Bible says, you need to remember from whence you have fallen. And you need to repent. And you need to do the first works again. And then the Lord says, if you don't, then this is what's going to happen. I'm going to come and I'm going to remove your candlestick. Now someone says, well, what around the world is he talking about there? Well, if you go up to verse 20 of chapter 1, he says the candlestick represents the church. Now what's he saying? He's basically saying, if you don't get your act together, then I'm going to extinguish you. I was born and raised in Mississippi. I can take you to two places today where a church building still exists, but the church is dead. There are no people. And so what this passage of Scripture says to me is this. Given the circumstances that we face today, we have got to pay attention to God's plan to continue to hand down the message. Now, look at the second point. The things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same things commit to faithful men. The same things commit to faithful men. Now, that means that the message that I preach today is got to be the same message that faithful men preach, that Timothy preached, that the Apostle Paul preached. I've got to continue to preach the same message. Now, we may package it a little differently. It may uh, be in a PowerPoint format. It may be um, in some other format or whatever. But it's got to be the same message. Now, <clears throat> there was a time when we could count on um, stopping at a building that had a sign out in front of it that said such and such Church of Christ, and we would know what was going on behind the wall. Right? We'd know that, well, if they were organized, they would have elders and that they would be males. And that they would have preaching and that would be done by a man. And that there would be women functioning effectively in the ways in which God expects them you know, to function also. That there'd be the Lord's Supper, right? And that it'd be on the first day of the week. Am I right about this so far? And that it would have certain elements, unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, and so forth. You can't always count on that. His life and I, traveling some years ago, here's a suggestion for you and then for me. If you take a vacation, be sure you get your worship plan. We didn't do that. We dropped the ball, Brother Neil. So on Sunday morning, we're traveling and, and uh, we're wanting to worship. So we stop at a place to worship. Walk up to the door, an older gentleman meets us, and a very nice person. I introduced myself. I was teaching at Freed Hardman in the Bible department and so forth at that time. And he said, well, you might want to come back to our next service. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, this is our outreach service. I said, well, brother, I'm at the right place at the right time. I mean, I've preached the gospel all over this world. I've been involved in four or 500 gospel meetings. And I said, I'm here. I'm, I'm at, well, okay. But well, we were sitting toward the back, about, about where you are, Brother Key, just right, right in that area. And they had an order of worship. You know, a lot of congregations do that. Perhaps you all do that here. And it, and it had, uh, you know, the song numbers and who's to lead the prayer and so forth. And one of the things on the program that I found interesting was this. Share the blessing. 
And I thought, share the blessing. Emily, the first time I saw that, I, I was sitting there, and Ms. Light was sitting by me, and I thought it was a song. Do you ever do this? I'm trying to get the tune of the song to myself. And so I'm kind of, I was perhaps a little louder than I should have been, but I didn't realize it. And I was saying, share, share, the, share the blessing. Share. And I just never could get it. And she punched me in the ribs, and she says, it's not a song, dummy. And, and now I'm thinking, wow, what's share the blessing about? And I'm all excited. So I got the order of worship here, and, and somebody leads the prayer, and I check that off. And then we have another song. I check that off. And then I'm thinking, we ain't got but three more things until we get to share the blessing. So I can't wait. You know what share the blessing was? The preacher's wife got up and did a solo and then led the church in singing. That was share the blessing. And I was, I was getting pretty nervous about that. Now, that's something that I didn't expect. Would you expect that? No, we wouldn't expect that. Of course we would not. And so this charge lays down the necessity of continuing the process, but it also lays down the necessity of preaching the truth, preaching God's Word. That's what this is telling us to do. Now, the Apostle Paul was a smart man. No wonder God chose him to be the uh, vessel to go to the Gentiles. I mean, here's a man, he knew Greek, he knew Latin, he knew Hebrew, he knew the classics. But the message that he preached was not a message that he came up by his own ingenuity. The message that he preached was the message which was given to him. I delivered to you, first of all, that which was given to me, he says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. Listen to how he says it in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter uh, 1. I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me, is not according to man. Now watch it. I did not receive it from a man, nor was I taught it, implied by a man, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the message that he preached was not a message that he was clever enough to come up with, but rather it was a message that God was good enough to give him. And that's what we've got to speak in this rather hostile environment that we find ourselves in uh, today. It's incredibly important that we do this. Now turn with me, if you would, to a passage in Psalms, Psalm 78. I just want to show you, perhaps this would have been better if I had put this in, in my first point about the process. Listen, he's, he says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Drop down to four. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done, that they should make them known to their children. Uh, verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and may not be like their hard-headed father. Well, sorry may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Brother, let me tell you something. The most important thing that we can do as parents is to hand down the same message. The most important thing that the elders of this congregation can do is to make sure that the same message is declared in this pulpit. That's the most important thing that any congregation can do, that any um, uh, parent can do. We've got to do that. In the book of Exodus in chapter 12, you have the institution of the Passover. Remember that? And do you remember in the institution of the Passover that God said to Moses, one of these days your children are going to rise up and they're going to ask you, what does this mean? And God said to Moses, you tell them that you were a slave in Egypt, and you tell them that you were delivered out by my mighty hand. Brethren, here's what I'm trying to, trying to emphasize. We have the obligation. It is incumbent upon us to tell our children you know, what this is about. I've taught school for 35, 6, 7 years. And I can tell you on more than one occasion, I've had a mother in tears call me 
and say, Brother Life, I don't know what happened. I sent my boy, you know, there, and and um, and and uh, you know, now he's he's going to some denomination, and and he's not faithful to the church anymore, and so forth. And and I don't understand what's happened. I know what's happened. You know what's happened? He never got it up here. He didn't get it. He went through some motions. Oh, Mama took him to church and and so forth, and and he saw the Lord's Supper go by. You know, there's a tray. Here here goes another tray. And uh, here's another tray. He witnessed all of that and even participated in it, but he didn't get it, see. He didn't own those beliefs. He didn't own the values. I've seen it happen time and time again. Where there is a message given to someone to this effect. This is what you're supposed to believe. This is what you're supposed to think. I'm just not bent that way. We need to be people who are critical thinkers. I'm a first generation Christian. My my folks were not religious people. My dad took a job with a Christian family and was taught the gospel. And then I came along not long thereafter. It means a lot to me. I have been forgiven a lot. My folks have been forgiven a lot. You know, in Luke chapter 7, you remember the Bible says that that woman who was a sinner loved much because she had been forgiven a great deal. And so it means a lot to me. I've seen what the gospel has done, you know, with a drunken father. I've seen how the gospel has shaped, you know, my own father's life. I've seen, you know, what it's done in a family unit. So it means a lot to me. And I want to know what I believe. And I want to know that I know what I believe. And so I search this book. And I study for myself. And I say, don't tell me what to think. Let me just study it for myself. You can help me, you can give me guidance, you can give me some instruction, but at the end of the day, i got to know it for myself. Am I right about that? I'm not going to just say, well, that's what Brother Decker says, or that what, that's what Brother Richie says, or, or that's what you know, someone else says. I want to be able to say, this is what God says. Now, you don't accomplish that unless you spend some time in critical thinking. I used to teach a class at Fried Hardeman called Values in Human Thought, and one of the first things that I would say is, it is not my task in this class as such to change your beliefs and or your values, but it is my task to help you own your beliefs and values. If you don't own it, then your children won't own it. I was uh, doing some preaching in Texas one time, and I was talking to this man <clears throat> uh, who was a member of the church there, and a uh, multimillionaire, and he was making arrangements for his sons to buy his business. That was interesting to me. They worked, you know, for him. And I said, buy your business? He said, yes. If they want it, they'll have to buy it. And he told me in the course of our visit that he had witnessed so many businesses being lost in the third generation. And I said, tell me more. He said, my wife and I discovered this business. We've worked our livers out, you know, for you know, 30 years, you know, developing the, the business. We've worked like 80 hours a week and so forth, you know, to make it. If I just give it to them, they'll maintain it, and their children will lose it. And I got to thinking about that, and I've asked many business people about this, and they verify it. But I thought, I wonder if that's applicable in the Lord's church. See, I'm a first-generation person. And so I could say, wow, okay, I've worked hard, I've figured it out, you know, here it is, and then I could say to my daughter, you know, here, believe it. You accept it. And out of love and out of respect for me, guess what? She's going to practice it, you see? But she doesn't get it. And guess what? Her children are not going to adopt it. And so it's imperative then that we continue the process, as I said in my first point, and it's imperative that in the process that we faithfully reproduce the Word, the truth. Number three, notice that this verse says something about a challenge. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same things commit thou, or you commit. You commit these same things. 
You do it. That's the challenge. See, that's an individual responsibility. So Paul says to Timothy, I've received something, and I'm giving it to you, and I want you to continue to give it to faithful people. So it's an individual responsibility. So as we face you know, our trials, as we face the tribula tribulations you know, of today's world, and so forth, we must face the individual responsibility of communicating the message of God. Now, wait a minute, preacher. That's the preacher's responsibility. I mean, after all, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, For though I preach the gospel, I, ne I have nothing to glory out, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's the preacher's passage. That's everybody. Everybody has the responsibility to share the faith. Now, you may not do it in a pulpit like this, but you have the responsibility to share the faith. Every, every father, every mother, every husband, every wife, every son, every daughter, every person has the responsibility. Well, I don't, yeah, no, I'm just not, I'm not too good at that or whatever. Well, you may not do it in speaking. You may not do it in teaching a class. You may not do it in, in uh, ways that we normally think about sharing the faith, but you still have responsibility. Everybody does. I said something like this one time, uh, Scott, and uh, a lady came up to me. This was on a Sunday night. She said, oh, Brother Life, I just can't do anything. She went down her two lists. Jenny, the first list was stuff women can't do. She said, I can't preach, I can't. Uh, be an elder, I can't be a deacon, and so she went down that list. Then she went down her other list, stuff I don't think I can do. I don't work well with children, and and um, and she went down those things. And so I guess she thought I was going to pat her on her head and say, go thy way, be warmed and filled. But I didn't do that. And I said, well, sister, let me ask you something. Can you bake an apple pie? And she sort of got her feathers ruffled. She said, well, of course I can bake an apple pie. I said, well, I want you to bake one. I said, no, I want you to bake two. I'd, I'd like to have one of them myself. And, and then I said, I want to know, do you know somebody in the community that who's, who's lonely? They, 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 don't have, they don't have a spouse, maybe, or their spouse has passed away. Or, oh, yeah, and then she mentioned somebody's name. And she said, actually, I've not seen her since I went to her husband's funeral almost six months ago. I said, take her an apple pie. She said, what do you mean? I said, look, this is not complicated. You know a person, you said you can bake a pie, take her a pie. I was on a Sunday night. She said, well, I guess I could do that. I said, well, hang on, we're not done. Can you do it tomorrow? Here's my conviction. I've worked with people long enough to know that if you don't get a commitment, more than likely it's not going to happen. Am I right about that? I invited somebody to church the other day, and they said, I'll try. And I looked them right in the face, and I said, you know you're telling me no. No, I said, I'll try. I said, listen, I, I, I didn't come in on the last watermelon truck or whatever. I know that I'll try means no. Now, am I right about that? Or I'll come maybe. That's a no. you got to listen for things like that. And I just confront people, and, and they came. But they came after they gave me a commitment. I said, I don't want to be here and I'll try. I don't want to be here and maybe so. I want to know, you know, will you come to service tonight? I'll be there. Okay, that's all I need. And so I said to her, I said, will you take this apple pie tomorrow? No, I can't do it. Why can you do it Tuesday? No. Can you do it Wednesday? No. He said, you're awful pushy. I said, you just said you could make a pie and if you would take it, I'm just trying to help you find out when we're going to do it. So we got to Thursday. She okay, I can do it Thursday. I said, okay, we're going to do it in the morning, we're going to do it in the afternoon. Oh, brother. She said, okay, I'll do it in the morning. I said, okay, so you're telling me then that this coming Thursday before noon, you're going to have a pie made, it's going to be apple in content, and you're going to take it to, I said, what was her name? And she told me, I said, you're going to take it to her. Is that right? She said, yeah. I said, okay, great. God bless you. She said, what do we do? I thought, oh, boy. I said, you go, you eat apple pie, you drink coffee, you talk about your cat, you talk about your dog, you talk about your grandchildren, 
talk about your garden. I don't care what you do. I said, just go do it. And then do it the next week. And do it the next week. And I said, before you know it, you'll have some soil prepared. And then say to your friend, would you care if I brought a friend of mine who likes apple pie too? And then I said, you take that friend who's able to sow some seed. You might not be able to plant the seed, but you are, it sounds like, someone who can get some soil ready. And so see, my idea of evangelism is this. Everybody can participate. I can't make an apple pie. It's, I am incapable of, maybe I'm capable, but I don't know how to do that. But you can do that, perhaps. That's, that's something that's simple for some people. And um, I, I think that, that we forget about little things like that. You know, even if we take, if, even if we give a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord Jesus, we're doing something for Him, are we not? So can you give a ride to someone? Can you help someone uh, who maybe needs, um, they, they can't go get their medication? Can you, you know, help cut their grass? You know, whatever. I had a neighbor one time, and he had a surgery, and he couldn't cut his grass, and he prided himself, you know, in his yard, and he was fretting about it and all that. I just went over and cut his grass. I mean, it's simple. I can do that. Can you do that for somebody? See, when you do that, you're letting your light shine and you're planting, you're preparing the soil and you're getting it ready to plant the seed. And so everybody can do something. Brethren, listen to me. Are you listening? We are not reservoirs of the gospel of Christ. You know what a reservoir does? I told you I'm from Mississippi. I don't know a lot about Georgia and its lakes and so forth. But in Mississippi in the north, you got Arca Butler Lake. Then you go a little south, you got Sardis Lake. Go a little bit farther south, you got Enid Lake. I was raised three miles from Enid Lake. Actually, my daddy's daddy's farm is under that lake. They took it, that eminent domain deal. You know, I think they gave him maybe 20 bucks or something. But at any rate, go so farther south, about 30 miles, you got Grenada Lake. And then you go down around Jackson, you got Ross Barnett Reservoir. All of these are man made lakes. Guess what they do? They hold water. We have not received the gospel to hold it. A, a, we're pipelines, not reservoirs. The, a pipeline is a means of conveyance through which oil or water or gas or something like that goes. And, and you see, we, we are means by which the gospel is spread. So we're not reservoirs. Uh, let me use a metaphor if I can. You probably have a picture in your Bible. I've got a map or two left in mine. Here, here's a picture right here of Palestine. And in the north, you've got this sea called the Sea of what? Galilee. I hope to see it one day. I've studied a lot about it. 13 miles long, about 7 miles wide. Men have made their living there for hundreds of years. Flowing out of it is what? The Jordan River. And it goes on south and lands where? In the Dead Sea. And guess why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? It's a Dead Sea. It doesn't do zip. It just says, just give, give, give. And that's the way I think sometimes, you know, um, that we do. Just give it to me, and I'm going to hold it. You're going to be a dead person. You're going to be a dead church. See, we're not, we, we've not received the gospel to hold it. Brother. We've received the truth to preach it. We've received the truth to share it. No matter what trial, no matter what difficulty, no matter what persecution you know we may face, we're reservoirs, or not reservoirs, we're pipelines you know, of the gospel. Now some people get a little bit more excited about sharing this than others. And I don't know, I don't know how you plant desire in people. Ms. Life and I raised three girls. They're 43, 42, and 39. And I said to her one day, I am like 99.99% sure that we're the parents of these kids. But I don't know for the life of me, you know, why one of them is like this. <laughs> you know, I can tell you all, it's time to go to bed. I'd hear something. One of them would be under the covers with a flashlight, studying more, reading more. And another one would be, oh, okay. I, I, said, I said, don't you have tests tomorrow? Ah, yeah, I think I'm going to go to bed. Failed, dropped out of school, quit. I'm thinking, what in, 
in heaven's name is going on with you? And then a light bulb, thank the Lord, clicked, you know, later, and she's done quite well. So I just don't know how to put desire in people. Do you? You have two children, Emily. Are they different? Yes, they're different. We have three. Are they different? Yes. I mean, it's unbelievable how much different it is. You know, one has great desire. One never gives me any problems and so forth. And then you got another one, and I'm thinking, well, okay, what did I do wrong here? And truth be told, you know, they're all individual, aren't they? And they all develop at different paces. Am I right? You know about that? And they all have different levels of desire. Is that correct? And so I don't know how to motivate, you know, people, but um, here, here's what I'm trying to say to us. We are saved by the precious blood of Jesus. Is that right? And, and uh, we've been forgiven. I wouldn't wish on people the, the kind of upbringing that I had at all, but it has contributed to my great desire, you know, to share the gospel of Christ, to let other people know about there's this other way of living. You know, I think that, that some sometimes folks who are like, as it were, born into the church and have lived in this sheltered environment forever, uh, they've not witnessed, you know, any any other things in life. And I wouldn't have you witness it at all. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying I, I think sometimes we don't have the same level of desire, you know, to share the gospel because we hadn't seen that that other side. So help us be pipelines of the gospel. You know, it's hard to keep good news to yourself, isn't it? I love John chapter 1 when Andrew found Jesus. What's the first thing he did? Peter, we found him. Isn't that what it says? One torch lights another torch. We found him. Now you go tell him. We found him. You go tell him. We cannot but speak the things that we've seen and heard. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 with Peter and John. And then finally, this verse says, the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I think that applies equally to women and the roles that God has given them. But the point is, a faithful person is a loyal person, a trustworthy person, a dependable person. That's what a faithful person is. So we've got to be those kind of people if we're going to be able to continue to, to preach the truth in the face of, of the difficulties that we have today. What does it mean, you ask? Let me tell you what it means. Let me try to illustrate it the best I can. You cannot take a once-a-week attender and send that person to the non-attendee attendee, and win faithful attendance. You can't do it. You cannot send the social drinker to the alcoholic and win sobriety. I mean, this is not rocket science. If you want to sell me a Ford car, you better drive a Ford. Don't come to me and say, Brother David, you need to buy a car like this. Well, what do you drive? Well, I drive something else. Well, why don't you drive that? Oh, I don't want to drive a car like that. I mean, hello, does that make any sense? you got to believe in the product you know, that you're selling. and uh, some people object to this kind of thinking, but I believe that the gospel is a product, and I'm a salesman, and I believe in it, and I want to sell it to you. I want to sell it to hearts and minds. I want people to believe it and obey it. So we got to be faithful. To what a what a great charge! Ezra chapter seven verse ten. I just thought of this verse. It says Ezra set his heart seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. We can't be very successful in teaching people if what? If we're not doing it. Am I right? To the Jews in Romans chapter 2, Paul said, You who teach not to steal, do you steal? You who teach not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And then he basically says this, because you're, practice, or because you're preaching one thing and practicing another thing, the Gentiles do blaspheme God got 